Hello, uh, uh, I'll start this session now. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'm Peter Bradley from uh, Public Health England. Uh, despite what it says on the slide, uh, my job title is Director of Health Intelligence. Um, and what I'd like to share with you today is uh, why data is uh, becoming uh, increasingly important in the work that we do in Public Health England. My background's actually medical. So it's quite interesting, why is somebody like me here today? Um, I want to give you examples of uh, the reasons why we do the work. We do uh, some knowledge about how we work with our audiences, some examples of analysis, and just finish up with a couple of uh, challenges that we have, and uh, uh, particularly working in the public sector. So um, today's session, first of all, so um, we're going to cover the examples that I've just talked about. And um, I'll just start with an explanation of what uh, Public Health England is really about. So first of all, we have a number of duties. One of them is to keep the population safe. So uh, if there's a chemical incident or uh, something goes wrong in the environment or there's an infectious disease outbreak, we'll be there. Uh, we're also uh, there to try to improve health in the population generally. And uh, we, we do that so people obviously live happier lives, but also so they're less dependent on services like the NHS. Um, we are particularly concerned about the health inequality gap. So here we're talking about the number of years that people have uh, living a healthy life. And depending on where you grow up, that can vary by 19 years. So some people get ill in their 50s, other people in their 70s, and that has a profound impact on the final section, which is the economy. So uh, healthier society is obviously uh, very helpful to our economy and to the general standard of living. And that's what uh, Public Health England sees its role as being. Um, data and evidence is crucial to what we do, but it's not the only thing. Uh, at the end of the day, we need people to use that data and evidence, and we guide our work by the use of this knowledge to action cycle, which uh, allows us to use data to define our priorities. What's the problems? Which are the biggest ones? Um, evidence to decide out of the many approaches we have, uh, which are going to be the most successful. We implement something and then we evaluate it and so the data comes back in again. And that allows us to make sure that we're constantly focusing on uh, health outcomes. And uh, in the development of our technology, we always have to think about what is really going to do that job. So um, another thing that we recently are very uh, clear about is when we are wake working with the many audiences that we do to improve health, we need to be very conscious of what they need. Um, and user uh, design, user-led design is becoming very important for us. And um, in the production of our data outputs, our intelligence outputs, we're beginning to use this more and more and working up prototypes and testing them and using the traditional digital um, design methodologies. So um, an example um, here would be that uh, we are um, we need to ensure that every uh, output that we have is produced in a very timely way for our uh, and in an appropriate way for uh, our audiences. And we've begun to understand the way that information flows across uh, organizations. So if we took an example here of maybe a local authority. Uh, we have on the left-hand side, we've got uh, people a bit like me. We're data lovers. We love the outputs that we have. Um, and but in order for us to actually have a bit of an impact on action, we need to work through the people in the middle of this diagram who we refer to as the translators. And they are the people who are able to bridge what we do 
to the decision makers. And these decision makers are uh, people who are influenced by many factors. So it could be a chief executive in a local authority or somebody who's doing a similar job in the NHS. And they are influenced by many things above all, probably the politics. So we need to provide uh, our information for these translators in an appropriate way. In order to do this, we've started to develop uh, profiles of the types of people we're trying to target. So here we have Fola. She's a, a commissioner of drugs and alcohol services. And the kind of thing she'd need to do is understand exactly what the trends were, uh, the issues for alcohol and drugs in her area, and also know what the solutions to solving those problems might be. At the same time as this, obviously, the data that we're able to access and use is changing all the time. So now we have a, a volume of data that we've uh, never experienced before, terabytes of data. Um, the data is changing in uh, its timing, as uh, going from data where we had a big time lag, maybe an annual survey or a monthly return on hospital episode statistics, to data in real time, stream data. Um, we have a variety of data. So on our main portal, uh, which is called Fingertips, which you might like to look at, we have lots of profiles. And on there, we have at least 100 sources of data to create those profiles. Um, we need to look at the data quality and its accuracy, its veracity, and also then work out, out of all of these possibilities, what is the actual value to uh, improving a public health outcome. So we have to do all that for Fola too. And um, what we've learned from our experiences of, of working with people like Fola is that they do indeed need data that's provided together with research evidence. So it tells you the problem and the solutions. We need to produce it in a way that is going to be really easy for her to just pick up and take to the decision makers. And we need to do it at the right time. So it might be uh, giving information at the right time in a commissioning cycle, for example. So at the end of the day, if we don't do that, whatever we do with the technology is never going to hit home. And we won't get the outcomes that we are looking for. But as well as that, of course, we have got this big um, drive in, uh, in technological change. Uh, so first of all, there's the data, which, as I say, is coming from many more sources than we have previously experienced. Um, lots of new, exciting types of data. The technologies that we have to analyze it, derived from data science, mostly. Um, and also rapid growth in other areas, which I know you've heard from other speakers, but um, the NHS has launched its Artificial Intelligence Lab, for example. We had a, an announcement from Secretary of State in a, in a recent Green Paper about predictive prevention, which you may have heard of, but this is really data-driven, potentially individualized approaches to try to prevent health problems. Um, we've seen the emergence of UK alliances between the public sector, commercial sector, and uh, the academic sector, such as uh, Health Data Research UK. Um, and all of this is providing a very different environment to the one that we've had previously. Um, the data itself is uh, now available in many forms. We have data on the problems that people have, the, the, the phenotype, uh, what they're exposed to, uh, the, what uh, we have this in large uh, geographies and smaller geographies, and we also have behavioural data from, um, you know, uh, wearable devices. And currently, um, we um, have the majority of that data, but not all of it. So some of the things uh, that we don't have would be the the data from wearable devices. But I can imagine that uh, very soon we would aspire to join that data up and create very different profiles than the ones that we have today. And it is about the linkage of that data that is the very exciting prospect for us. 
Um, it's going to have major implications for our data systems and data platforms. And I know some of the other speakers have been talking about that. And it's exactly the same for us in the public sector. So um, I just want to move on now and talk, uh, give you some examples of the kind of analysis that we, we have done and that we are hoping to do. And I think it's fair to say that so far uh, we've based a lot of our analysis on what's already happened. And what we're trying to do is move to a position where we are trying to predict more of future health problems so we can take action before it actually happens. But sometimes, even now, the uh, retrospective analysis is very meaningful. Um, so the first example I want to give you is one where we uh, looked at a range of indicators, a, a, a very broad range of indicators, all concerning health. And we used uh, supervised and unsupervised machine learning to uh, look at the pattern of health in uh, England. Uh, to try and see if there were uh, patterns that we hadn't really understood before. Um, and we found that there was, and we've called it the London effect. And so there is an animation over uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, and here it compares your, expect your expected lifespan with uh, the level of deprivation, which is on the, on the bottom axis. And the animation looks and analyzes this in, in five quintiles. So starting with the, the poorest areas and moving up to the final part of the animation, uh, which are the more affluent areas. And what we found was that London has a different pattern. Nearly everywhere else in the country, poverty is the thing that drives, or deprivation drives, poorer health. But in London, that relationship isn't as clear. Actually, if you're um, in the poorest parts of London, your health is probably slightly worse, if anything, than the rest of the country. Well, when we come to look at the more affluent areas, even in the middle of uh, society, we find that Londoners' health is far, far better. And this is really important to us because we have the, uh, the start of an idea of how we might be able to improve health in other regions if we can investigate further. So I can talk to anyone about that after the talk if they're interested. Um, so the next um, area that we'll want to look at is to... Um, is to just uh, look at text analysis and how that's helping us target information to certain groups. So the example I'm going to give you is around vaccination. So I'm sure you know vaccination has been controversial. Um, and and uh, a lot of this was based on a uh, false uh, uh, connection between the link of one particular vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and autism. Um, and it was basically scientific fraud, but uh, the, uh, the concern around that has continued for decades now. So what we're able to do is look at uh, the Twitter feed. In this case, we looked at every uh, Twitter feed that had vaccine, nearly everyone. And we can begin to understand uh, the sentiment behind these, these Twitter feeds the types of people who are showing concern. And it allows us to target messaging um, so that the appropriate scientific advice is given to groups to, to counteract this myth that has uh, persisted in, in, the, uh, in society around vaccination. So the next example uh, that we're trying to look at is moving more into the predictive elements where we're actually trying to uh, predict the future so that we can use our resources more appropriately, particularly, and make sure that services are geared up to deal with the demand that will uh, come to them. So this example is um, from uh, NHS, and it's to do with the number of uh, attendances you would expect in an accident and emergency department. And we used R here to um, create a model that predicts the number of uh, attendances. And what we found is that this model is very accurate. We've obviously tested it uh, with the real data as the, the 
statistics have come through. And we now feel we'll be able to predict the number of accidents in emergency by the hour for several years in advance. And this is really important, obviously, for NHS planners and making sure that the demand uh, meets the supply. So moving on uh, a little bit further and just to think about um, direct public communication, which so I've talked a lot about how we work with stakeholders, but this is more about how we might work with the, the public directly. So for a while now in um, Public Health England, we've uh, been using uh, micro-targeting in, micro, in our marketing activities. And uh, through the creation of profiles, a bit like I was talking about Fowler and, uh, and making sure that the messages are going to the right people in the right way so that it fits in with their lives. And uh, one of the examples from this is, uh, is smoking. So the accuracy of targeting for smoking has increased enormously from in about eight year span from 20% to about 92%. And uh, this is a much, much more efficient use of our resources too. Obviously, smoking is a very big problem for public health generally. So the more good work we can do there, the, the better. Um, but we, we're now moving towards a possibility of having a much more personalized approach um, where we can um, improve health by using the data that's coming through big data potentially and um, making sure that we are using all those possibilities that we have through, in terms of using data from smartphones and uh, citizen-generated data in all its forms. So, um, what we, um, we need to do uh, to bring this forward is obviously um, to try to create um, an environment where we are really focusing on empowering the public to use their own data so that they can take full responsibility for their own health and um, allow them to share that data with their, their health professionals um, to ha help the frontline uh, healthcare workers access that data because I'm, I'm sure many of you have relatives and sometimes when you use the health service it's actually quite difficult to uh, get the data there in real time. And, and obviously that data, when it's accumulated, can inform decision makers about how they develop their services for the future. So the sorts of things we are thinking about are um, maybe making the health check, which is a, a check that's given to all people in England between 40 and uh, 74. Um, and the, the purpose of the check is to try to prevent problems like heart disease or stroke or kidney disease, that sort of thing. Um, but offering in the future this uh, test as a digital option. So we've got an example here of Paul. I don't know whether you can read the, uh, the text, but Paul might be offered his, uh, his check, first of all, digitally he would be able to input his own data. So it might be things about his weight, or maybe he's had a blood pressure check at the local uh, pharmacy. And then maybe the, the digital uh, service would identify him as low risk, but might advise that he, he did a bit more exercise. He, he began to swim or, or something like that. And then he would be able to receive um, prompts uh, and nudges to encourage him to uh, be very active. Um, he would get uh, feedback on, the, uh, on his heart rate and things like that during the activity. And uh, he would see over time that his fitness had improved, hopefully, and it would encourage him to do more. So he would be able to take a lot more responsibility. And um, um, of course, if any problems uh, occurred, they would be notified and they would be shared with his GP. So that's the kind of thing we wonder we might be able to move to in the future. So there are um, inevitably some uh, challenges with this uh, approach. And if this is going to become a reality, we're, we are going to have to think very closely about um, 
what is it that the public really want to share in terms of the data and what do they want to use it for? Uh, we work already very closely with the, uh, the National Data Guardian and other groups that are concerned about information uh, governance and this is a really big area for us. We, we, we can't currently link a lot of our data because um, it's, it's not deemed appropriate. So the need for that debate is, is really crucial. Um, obtaining some of the data is quite difficult, um, so I think that's another area that we, we really need to think about. Um, um, artificial intelligence and, uh, and related activities are, um, can introduce bias, so the way that we train our data is very important. We don't want to be prejudicing people who we are most trying to help. If I go back to that point about health inequalities, um, and we sometimes need to also just say that actually uh, the innovative methodologies don't help. So it's about choosing when to use them so that they actually produce those best public health outcomes. Sometimes we can actually rely on traditional analysis. And keeping up with things, that's really tricky. I don't think uh, government is known for being super speedy, if I may say that, and, uh, and I think for all of us probably that is quite a challenge. Um, so obviously we, the other challenges I'd mention are the transparency. So when we're using algorithms, actually understanding what lies behind them is uh, very difficult to explain to others. Uh, so we're having the skills uh, for people to be able to address that is particularly important to us. Um, so I think I'll just move on to, um, there's, and there are other challenges other speakers have mentioned, so just the needs for us to be uh, really clear about our information governance and the legislation and, and issues of that nature. So um, I suppose my final points would be um, the health uh, data environment is actually quite complex and it does involve us using many data types. Um, I think as we move forward, collaboration with the academic and the commercial sector is going to be crucial. I can't imagine we're going to be able to do this on our own. Um, we do need to find ways that we are really keeping up with the latest approaches. Um, but at the same time, even though that technology is really exciting, um, I have to keep a focus on the fact that whatever we do is really going to help the population's health, and particularly those people whose health is most at risk. And we need to balance the, uh, uh, the benefits for individuals um, as against the needs for us uh, to benefit the population. So I'll just finish with those thoughts, and in the few minutes left, um, I'm very happy to take any questions.